Good evening, friends. It is, in fact, evening here in southern Ontario. The uh, last uh, gasps of a sunny and pleasant spring afternoon. After two days of storm and stress, Sturm und Dang. Snow somewhere, rain other other places. Uh, we got rain here, and uh, not much to be happy about. But certainly uh, today we uh, started smiling again. So welcome to you all to another poetry show number five, and I would like to uh, continue on with some of the ones I uh, featured in number four. So good are these books. The Global Poetry Anthology. And a poem by Gillian Pattinson called The Infinite Library. There's a man climbing the book stacks all he's read behind and beneath him, part now of the firmament on which he balances his ladder. He has been a long time climbing, reading as he goes. He remembers it all. No need to down climb, backtrack, reread. Long as his years of climbing, his recollection of all he's read, hands, eyes, and feet, all fluency, economy. Deft and steady, his ascent. He keeps to the hardbound literature. Anthologies and well-read authors make the soundest steps. From time to time, he stumbles upon a slim volume of obscure origin whose weight belies the name. These he carries with him, letting go only when the burden of whispers buckles his legs, sending a tremor through the edifice. Like feathers they drift into darkness, no echo returning to tell of the fall. Even as he climbs, reads, climbs, the stacks grow taller, yet he never tires, each shelf firing his attempt at the next. No lack of oxygen in the bookish air, and ever the chance of a fresh breath. Something not quite new, but sharp enough to raise a gasp, release a sigh. Quiet as a dust moat circulating in a light shaft. Between the towering stacks, he climbs, directed by the voice of every author, accompanied by every character. All his life, it seems, he has been climbing, paragraph by paragraph, page upon page, book stacks growing ahead and behind. Never enough time, never enough light for so much yet unread. Still he climbs, having come so far, unsure now of the way down, knowing how deep the silence that greets the fall. Now one by Suparna Ghosh, called Unlimited. It's a monolith, thought the gull, alighting on her shoulder. A monument, mused the spirit, whistling through her walls. A pillar, whispered the wind, twirling round her limbs. A village revealed the crier, surveying her space. 
A forest roared the storm, swirling about her hair. A poem sang the song, hearing a lute in her hum. A damask decided the novel, etching a tail on her skin. With the sky in one eye and the ocean in the other, she decides she's the gut of the earth. Indeed. Now, couple more from uh, John Ashbery's uh, recent translation of uh, Rimbaud's Illumination. Um, many translations of this over the years, I believe. Um, but, you know, who can put aside John Ashbery's translations? Uh, definitely an event in uh, poetry. do two more tonight. This one's called Mystical. On the slope of the embankment, angels swirl their woolen dresses through pastures of steel and emerald. Meadows of flame leap to the top of the knoll. On the left, the compost of the ridge has been trampled by all the homicides and all the battles and all the catastrophic sounds describe their curve. Behind the right hand ridge is a line of orients, of progress. And while the strip at the top of the picture is fashioned from the turning and leaping sound of the conches of the sea and of human nights, the flowery sweetness of stars and sky and the rest descends opposite the embankment like a basket against our face and creates the flowering and blue abyss down there. Hmm, the flowering of the blue abyss. Dawn. I embraced the summer dawn. Nothing was moving yet on the facades of palaces. The water was still. Encampments of shadows still lingered along the road through the woods I walked. I walked waking living and warm breaths, and jewels looked on, and wings arose noiselessly. The first undertaking in the pathway already filled with fresh, pale sparkles was a flower which told me its name. I laughed at the blonde waterfall disheveling itself through the pines. At its silver summit, I recognized the goddess. Then I lifted the veils one by one. In the pathway, gesticulating. On the plain where I denounced her to the cock. In the great city, she fled among the steeples and domes, running like a beggar, along the marble keys. I chased her. Farther up the road, near a laurel grove, I wrapped her in the veils I had collected, and I felt, a little, her immense body. Dawn and the child fell to the bottom of the wood. When I awoke, it was noon. Now, another French poet from the 19th century. From the last verses of Jules Laforgue, spoken of highly by T.S. Eliot, 
um, in his early work, I, and I believe declared an influence, or was it just a dedication? Well, I've always wondered. And now I understand. These poems from the uh, 1890s, now translated by Donald Revell, display quite clearly why Eliot was interested. I think you will recognize something of the tone of Eliot's early work in one of these. Sundays, this is called, from Last Verses, which were collected and published after his passing. <clears throat> To make a long story short, I'd nearly given myself away, saying, I love you. Then I realized that I was crazy. Myself? It's Galatea, blinding Pygmalion. Impossible to modify that situation. And so, poor, pale, pitiful man, believing in myself almost never, I saw my true love disappear, borne away by the way things go. I was a thorn in the dark, and she was a wind-blown rose. On this anniversary night, all the wind-blown Valkyries come back bellowing through cracks in the door. Only the lonely. So what? I should have been drunk from the start, but it's too late now. Baby doll's dead. Only the lonely? Big deal. Baby doll's dead and gone. The wind's been muzzled. The morning sky's been dressed for church. All right then, bells, ring out. All you Sunday bells, ring out. Put on your baby clothes and snowy robes. Wiggle your lavender frou-frou into the incense clouds and buttered rolls. Family first, only the lonely. So it goes. The girl with the ivory prayer book hurries head down home. Just look at her, whiter than white. Her little body knows she's from a planet better than mine. Oh, little sister, my body's sick in its beautiful soul. And now your piano playing, so natal, sets me off again. Your ignorant, anonymous heart stumbles through its etudes and pop tunes, hurting you? Valkyries, hurry, Valkyries of genocide and hypochondria. Your body's a jewel, your soul's a diva, and I'd gladly wring your neck to prove it's true and teach you to use such a body and such a soul with a man. Afterwards, maybe, you'd like to get to know me. No, love gnaws at the heart. It worships incurable organs. It withers into a gauze of gaze and the dying lovers go crazy. Her body's not the world to me and I'm not the man of her dreams. Why go on like idiots playing at sister-brother love? Soul and body, body and soul. Proud spirit of Eden, woman with man. In the meantime, stay straight, stick to your knitting, and pray. And as for you, last of the poets, get out a little. You look terrible. It's a nice enough day. People are out and about. Take a walk to the drugstore. Fix yourself up. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I can see some early Elliot there. No change of pace. Contemporary American poet, Jory Graham. 
from her collected uh, poems, The Dream of the Unified Field. Mind. The slow overture of rain, each drop breaking without breaking into the next describes the unrelenting, syncopated mind. Not unlike the hummingbirds imagining their wings to be their heart, and swallows believing the horizon to be a line they lift and draw. What is it they cast for? The poplars, advancing or retreating, lose their stature equally, and yet stand firm making arrangements in order to become imaginary. The city draws the mind in streets, and streets compel it from their intersections, where a little belongs to no one. It is what is driven through all stationary portions of the world, gravity's stake in things. The leaves pressed against the dank window of November soil, remain unwelcome till transformed, parts of a puzzle unsolvable till the edges give a bit and soften. See how then the picture becomes clear, the mind entering the ground more easily in pieces and all the richer for it. Um, just came across an uh, uh, older book by a uh, Canadian poet at P.K. Page. This was called Hologram from the mid-90s. And it's a study of the uh, early Renaissance form, the Glossa, where it's a complex little form. One quotes four lines from uh, another poet and then writes four stanzas, ten lines each, using uh, one line from the four lines quoted, and so on. It's a bit of technical wizardry, and I'm uh, quite sure it's an uphill climb to write. Anyway, uh, these are homages to, well, homage to various uh, well-known poets, Elizabeth Bishop, W.H. Auden, T.S. Eliot, um, D.H. Lawrence, Sappho, Dylan Thomas, and the one I'd like to read, for no particular reason other than I like it, uh, homage to Leonard Cohen. And she quotes from his uh, old poem, one of my favorites, I have not lingered in European monasteries. And she calls the poem inebriate. The quote is, during the day I laugh and during the night I sleep. My favorite cooks prepare my meals. My body cleans and repairs itself and all my work goes well. Here is eternity as we dream it, perfect, another dimension. Here the ship of state has sprung no leaks. The captain doesn't lie. The days are perfect, and each perfect minute extends itself forever at my wish. Unending sunlight falls upon the steep slope of the hillside where the children play. And I am beautiful. I know my worth, and when I smile I show my perfect teeth. During the day I laugh, and during the night I sleep. A dreamless, healing sleep. I waken to everlasting Greece as white and blue as music in my head, an innocent music. I had forgotten such innocence exists, forgotten how it feels to live with neither calendars nor clocks. I had forgotten how to un-me myself, now, as I practice, how and my psych heals. My
favorite cooks to prepare my meals. I am not without appetite, nor am I greedy. My needs are as undemanding as my tastes. Spring water, olives, cucumber, and figs, and a small fish on a white plate. To lift my heart, I have no wish for wine. The sparkling air is my aperitif. Like Emily, I am inebriate. Rude health is mine and privilege. I bathe in the sacred waters of the river Alf. My body cleans and repairs itself. Poised between earth and heaven, here I stand, proportions perfect, arms and legs outspread within a circle. Leonardo's man. So do I see the giddy cosmos. Stars beyond stars unfold for me and shine. My telephoto lens makes visible time future and time past, and timeless time receives me like its child. I am become as intricate and as simple as a cell. And all my work goes well. Wasn't that lovely? Some of the music we're listening to on uh, dual classical guitars is Bach. Some of it's Handel. Some of it's Vivaldi. Um, to celebrate, here's a little uh, reference to Bach in Jean Zwicky's uh, poem History. One of several titled History in the book Robinson's Crossing. And she wrote this after J.S. Bach's Concerto in D minor, BWV 1052. Someone is running fingers through their hair. The fingers are like fish. They flicker upstream while the current purls around their backs and falls away. The fish resemble wind inside a field of wheat, resemble solar flares. The fish are water that is trying to flow up itself. The gravity that hauls and tumbles it, deaf as the grief inside perfection. Do not ask. You are running fingers through your hair. This is what you do sometimes because you cannot put your hands around your heart. That was quite lovely. A um, little uh, Bach poem I wrote myself some years ago in the volume of Small Ecstasy for Glenn Gould. This was written during uh, an all-day CBC broadcast of the Well-Tempered Clavier, where it basically went on all day. <laughs> it's quite marvelous. Um, a Small Ecstasy for Glenn Gould. Enjoying a banana, bite by infectious bite, while pianists of every stripe strive and sometimes sail through the scintillant joy of Bach's sublime clavier. And the endless afternoon announces autumn's eternity in a light that plays with all your notions of illumination. I grin and go, yes! This is all that I want from Western culture. This is all that I need to know of magnificence. I'm ready now to enter that mirror on yonder wall. But perhaps I'll go through with my social engagements and make merry with whomever comes by. Poetry, our eternal friend. Greetings to all of you, wherever you are and wherever you're listening. More soon.